X-Factor number 7 is a stacked issue continuing the frankly best-in-class character explorations Leah Williams and David Baldion have been doing in the Reign of X with their mutant team of resurrection investigators. Today I'll answer, what is the massive mystery of Prodigy's resurrection and what do we learn from one of Scarlet Witch's sons? How impressive is the reformation of Deken here in the pages of X-Factor? What does the Morrigan have in store for the X-Factor team and theories and predictions? for things to come. Hey everybody, I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of comicbookherald.com. You are listening to Cracking Krakoa number 153. <laughs> Coming this weekend, Cracking Krakoa number 155 live at 12.30 Central Time on Saturday again. February 6th, pregame the Super Bowl with myself and comedian Jay Jordan. We're going to be doing a live X-Men team roster draft. We're going to do snake style if you play any fantasy football, and we're going to go through various X-Men heroes, villains, maybe some Moroccans in the mix, and we're going to pick who we think should be on the Jonathan Hickman X-Men roster. It should be a lot of fun. Come join us live. You can find a link in the show notes if you want to set that up on your calendar and be ready to join us and throw in your feedback in the live chat as well. Now, if you like the Comic Book Herald YouTube channel or Cracking Krakoa, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing. Spoilers for discussed comics will follow. Writer Leah Williams, artist David Baldion, colors by Israel Silva, and letters by Joe Caramagna. The big question coming into this issue as we see Prodigy and uh, his boyfriend, Tommy, the of the Young Avengers, uh, son of Scarlet Witch, maybe not boyfriend, probably don't, don't need to put labels on it, right? But they're romantically involved and have been at times, as we've seen out of the pages of the Kieran Jim Gillen and Jamie McKelvey Young Avengers. How did Prodigy die? Okay, there's a big question here. Did Prodigy die, right? There's some mystery, and there's been mystery throughout this this X-Factor run as to, like, okay, Prodigy was resurrected. His mutant powers are fully intact. That's good, right? But when and how did he die, okay? And Tommy, as his witness comes in, he literally speeds into his room and says, uh, your alleged death here is is false look we were making out at this time there's a photo during the time when they said you were killed okay now prodigy's alleged death is likely a reference to the pre-house and power setup in x-men and uncanny x-men disassembled kind of leading into age of x-men also so like okay so we're gonna dig in a little bit here because like what does it mean if he didn't actually die but he was resurrected the implication here <laughs> is that there are potentially two David's two prodigies running around somewhere like that there is a version of him that never died potentially okay given the fact that he seems to have been with Tommy on the night of his alleged death now also Tommy's presence running onto Krakoa a few questions pop up and maybe this is covered somewhere and I just missed it but like can he use the Krakoan gates because he's a mutant is that is that definitely confirmed or is he just a welcomed visitor right which I would buy either way he's also Scarlet Witch's son which again I feel like would carry some baggage on Krakoa you know great pretender and all so something to explore more moving forward it's not really the focus of this issue but I am quite curious how like Tommy and then obviously Billy who you know Wiccan is with Hulkling off in space most likely um so we're not gonna see as much of him but I'm curious like what is the reaction to Tommy um among mutant kind, among the various players on Krakoa, okay? One thing of X Factor that I really appreciate is creativity with the data pages. I feel like a, a number of writers and books, they're falling back into the, well, Hickman and, and Tom Muller established a, a visual sensibility to this, so we're just going to roll with that. I really like how in X Factor, there are, even if it's just simple stuff like, yes, here's a letter, here's an envelope, here's a notepad with paper, um, just little visual tricks that are slightly different, making the data pages different. That's awesome. I like more of that. I think Excalibur has done it well historically, and I think X Factor is doing it pretty well. But we do get this note here from Elixir to David, a.k.a. Prodigy, complicating the resurrection, right? So we get this data page saying his confirmation of death was mailed to the five. Okay, that basically it was like we got all these we got these um, uh, reports of the death, you know, these incidents mailed to us. This is before X Factor was established. So there wasn't like, you know, proof of death necessarily. There weren't these protocols in place. Um, but again, like we had a lot of X-Men. We had a lot of mutants present, including Wolverine and Cyclops. Uh, so we got confirmation. You know, here it is essentially. But as we see from Tommy now, this seems to be untrue. Okay, so something is fishy here. Something's going on. Why would David's confirmation of death have been in this group if he didn't actually die? Who is messing with this? Could it be the other David prodigy out there, right? Because my theory at this point is there are two of them. There are two of them in the world. And then there's this big question that becomes like, well, if someone's essence 
is backed up by Professor X, and then, like, you know, for lack of a better word, essentially, like, their soul is put back into them via the Krakoan resurrection protocols, what happens when there's two of them? This is a, a super interesting question that I think X-Factor is the right book to answer because, again, they are the resurrection protocols team. They are the ones who establish, like, making sure that resurrections go correctly. I'm really interested to explore what does it mean to have had a living character who has been resurrected on Krakoa, and I think that's what this book's going to do. Now, elsewhere, Leah's exploration and reformation of Deken, it's really, really fascinating stuff, honestly. And it's also like, x Factor is by far the sexiest X-Men book. I mean, it's very, very much leaning into um, just all sorts of different relationships, including the Ken and Aurora here. It is the queerest book of the bunch by far, so the diversity and representation throughout X-Factor is phenomenal. I don't, honestly, it's like unlike anything I've seen in a Marvel comic before. Like, I've never seen a Marvel comic uh, tackle this wide variety this and just like the casual wide variety of romance in the marvel universe and with these marvel teams i mean it's 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 so progressive in so many positive ways it's fascinating i also have to compliment too like the tenderness of the scenes between you know dekan and, and aurora like it's especially remarkable when you consider the character's background and how violent his stories have been throughout x-men comics of the 2000 you know this is the son of wolverine born into the world through violence is just kind of the initial arc is just like, I want to kill my dad, right? Like, whether we're talking Wolverine Origins, we're talking Uncanny X-Force written by Rick Remender, um, whether we're talking Dark Avengers, right? Like, it's been nothing but nonstop violence and, like, anti-hero villainy for this character. And now to have a moment to take a breath back and kind of be like, who am I? Why do I matter? Um, what kind of romance am I looking for? It's it's like, I, you didn't even realize it was a possibility. I didn't even realize it was a possibility for this character. And now in X Factor, here we are. Uh, elsewhere in the book, you know, we have Tommy and Northstar geeking out about like who, you know, fastest speed running and like different rules. Northstar just like, absolutely you know like living in glory with all the adulation that tommy's throwing his way super fun stuff like it's really fun to see two speedsters just talk like talk shop essentially <laughs> like it's really good and what it brings to mind for me is like this book's honestly on another level when it comes to giving every team member their moment and expanding their character i mean i talked about this with new mutants number 15 how vdl and rod rice's deaf maneuvering throughout characters and plot reminds me of claremont's own approach to x-men stories in the 80s right and like leah williams and david baldion are operating on a similar level but with with just way more of a concerted yet effortless examination of what makes these characters tick you know there's so much more just like who are these people and what did they do and why did they do it you know in such a again like that's the focus of the book that's what this book is about it's not necessarily focused on the plot now definitely in past reviews i've sort of resented this approach preferring instead those bigger hooks in the reign of x to be the primary focus you know there's a version of x factor number seven that is like very focused on prodigy's apparent false resurrection you know and in theory that's like like the thing that is the most interesting to me but it's to the credit of the creative team that seven issues into x factor i care more about literally every member of this team than i did as an x-men fan before the series launched with the possible exceptions of like rachel summers who i was you know i just i already enjoyed a great deal and maybe iboy maybe iboy who yeah i'm a big wolverine and the x-men fan you know which isn't to say there isn't progress on the plot. You know, there are big movements and there are big things happening, right? So we have, like, Dekan goes off on Siren's case because they're still try x Factor still trying to figure out why is she, you know, apparently, like, committing suicide over and over. Something's awry, but the only person who knows it's the Morrigan because she's possessed by this goddess of death is Polaris, who was hypnotized by Siren, right? But Iboy can tell that Polaris is lying, you know, to cover for the Morrigan slash Siren. Um, this eventually gets outed by Rachel Summers, who goes into her head and pulls the truth out of Lorna. And they all figure out that, uh-oh, it's the Morrigan, right? And she's been passing as Siren all along, as Rachel declares. Now, in another, again, very good creative use of a data page, we get some explanation of the Morrigan, of what this goddess is. Again, the main focus here, goddess of death, okay? And we also see Ken get his butt absolutely whipped by the Morrigan as he attempts to track her, you know, and just gets completely dominated. Now, thematically, this all really works quite well in X Factor. I mean, this is the death book. You're dealing with resurrections. You're dealing with confirming deaths. You're dealing with mysterious non-deaths. You have things like Prodigy studying dead bodies and their composition rates out like in the yard. And now you have the Morrigan, this goddess of death, okay? This is all like thematically very closely linked, which I think elevates X Factor. Now, after he's rescued from his absolute beating by the Morrigan, he gets some more fun, sexy time continuing for Deken and Aurora in the hot tub, you know, at least until brother Northstar is bellowing Aurora. There's a really interesting reference here, too, to like, you know, he asks, like, why is why is your brother always calling you like this? And it's, it's a really interesting reference from the creative team to the Age of X-Man, but, you know, by Aurora and its influence 
on North Star, essentially, that like all of these mutants being warped into this alternate reality, that that had a, a super influence on North Star as a character. We saw this in uh, Vidal has written New Mutants recently as well. Just the reference and sort of the allusion to the fact that like, yeah, Age of X-Men happened and it has influence. There might be characters who exist in this world now that debuted in Age of X-Men. It has an influence psychologically and potentially traumatically on North Star. I, that is interesting to me. We're seeing more of that from creators that were involved in that event, which obviously is like the holdover. You know, it's like the 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 tentative just kind of like wait, wait until we get to House and Powers era of X-Men. But I actually like that stuff being brought up again and kind of seeing what influence it might have in the future. Because there's some stuff there, you know, we saw from the cliffhangers at the end of that event that might still matter. Now, speaking of cliffhangers, X-Factor ends with a huge cliffhanger. It's a really jumping, uh, kind of jarring leap, actually, into like a the future like all of a sudden we get to this huge cliffhanger with what appears to be the morgan killing everyone in the boneyard except for dekan prodigy and iboy so the krakoan for next issue reads no one is safe that appears to be very true as they will be taking on uh the morgan herself this goddess of death and uh, this book has you know again like i was I, I think i've been positive yet critical of of what it's doing i think at this point like it's doing things with with character work and development that are unmatched like i don't think anything else in the x office is doing this work this well i think new mutants could get there but it's doing a lot of other things well as well you know but x factor specifically is just like we're spending time hanging with these characters as they go about you know this resurrection investigative unit and no one quite taps into this like as as confidently and as successfully as x factor i, I you know and i think for all of my praise of like you know, Jonathan Hickman is a creator and like big ideas and this and that. I mean, one of the criticisms that I think most aptly applies to that work and in the pages of X-Men is like, you know, the characterization can feel off, right? You have people who speak like philosopher kings all the time, you know, and it's like they all went to the same schools and read the same books and, you know, they kind of become mouthpieces for these like very quotable big ideas, which I tend to enjoy, but on a character level, it can be a little complicated. It can be a little wishy-washy, right? And I think there's a lot of times where that's not true and it's, you know, there's more Anyway, I don't need to do a defensive Hickman here. I think <laughs> I think you get it. Uh, but X Factor, like that's that's the focus of the book, and it's so good at these character beats. Um, again, I've said it. I think Leigh Williams is like without question one of my favorite writers in the X Office. Um, her work is is quite fascinating. The X Factor continues to grow on me in in very positive ways. So I'm I'm high on this issue. I definitely recommend checking it out. Again, if you are listening here and you like Cracking Krakoa, you can support the site over at patreoncom herald That is greatly greatly appreciated. I'm Dave. You can find my stuff at comicbookherald.com dot com at comic book herald on social look for the best comics ever in my marvelous year podcast for more from me so thanks everybody for listening and as always enjoy the comics